We now come to the eighth session in this module on discipleship. And for this session, turn to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. Perhaps uh, some of you have been parents, and some of you have, uh, ha- have had the, the tall task of, of traveling with kids. Uh, I have a, a sister who they would, they would leave uh, on their long road trips at 10 o'clock at night so that you go the entire night and, and your kids sleep the whole time and, and, they, uh, and, and they don't wake up. It makes traveling a lot easier. It provides this blessed peace when the kids are just sleeping. But then there's other times where it seems impossible to get them to rest. It seems impossible to get them to sleep. Uh, sometimes you'll maybe put them in that car seat and you'll start off and you'll think, oh, this is, you know, this is great. You did, you did it just right. And you, you didn't wake them up at all. But then as you go down the road, suddenly you hear from, from behind, uh, where are we going? I wonder if, if that thought, where, where are we going? Where are you taking me? I wonder if that thought crossed the disciples' mind one evening as Jesus suggested that they would go for a boat ride across the Sea of Galilee. And what a wild ride it, it turned out to be. They came to the other side, and, and remember, it, it's still dark as they approach the other shore. The region of the Gerasenes, that Matthew called the area of the Gadarenes, Luke calls the Gergesenes. It was, all the, it was all in the same area. So caves dot the, live stone, the limestone cliffs rising sharply from the, from the shore. At night, it, it creates this eerie sight. It, it's a bit like skulls. And so this is a, this is a, a strange and scary and eerie situation. It's a, it's a scary place, especially since many of these caves would also double as burial tombs. That's when the disciples might have wondered, just like those kids in the car seat, where are we going? Where are you taking us? If you're a follower of Christ, sooner or later, you may ask that question. It's because Jesus is going to call you to trust him enough to follow him into scary places. Let's face it, following Jesus, helping others to follow Jesus, can be scary. It's not always comfortable. It's not always safe. Sometimes he leads us into scary places so he can use us to share the gospel with people that we might not otherwise meet. He takes us out of our comfort zone. As you follow Jesus, can you think of scary places, maybe scary people, that you are facing, maybe avoiding? Let's find out how Jesus handles this scary situation considering Mark chapter 5. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes, and when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. And then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, For we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting right there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the, to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. 
As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Jesus is here showing his disciples that following him into scary places need not be so scary. That's an important lesson for you and for me today. Jesus is showing his disciples that following him into scary places doesn't have to be so scary. Jesus' experience with a very scary person, with the demoniac, provides an example to us for making disciples. Jesus here gives himself as an example for us to follow. And, and you might be thinking, well, what in the world does this mean I have to be casting out demons? Is this how I face scary people? I just call for the demons to leave. Well, not necessarily, but there's other ways in which we see Jesus as an example. And the first is that Jesus shows courage. Jesus does not avoid this strange and, and scary person. This is a violent, uncontrollable, unpredictable, and powerful man. He can't be reasoned with. He won't be restrained. He's self-destructive. He's fearful. He's antisocial. These are the people that we put in places where out of sight, out of mind. Because we don't know what to do with them. What scares us so much is that we can't understand it. What scares us so much is that it, 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 isn't, it isn't under control, it's out of control. He is demon-possessed. Not with one demon, but many. Le legion, literally, could mean, linguistically, up to 6,000. And So this is, this is a person with the power of Satan's kingdom behind him. Waiting to be unleashed. Jesus knows that he is the sworn enemy of that kingdom. The enemy that Satan despises, that, that Satan desires to destroy. We don't understand much about what's going on in the spiritual realm. There's only a few places in Scripture where the curtain is, is kind of pulled back for us to see. I'm thinking of a few portions in the book of Daniel where we read about angels that are, that are fighting on behalf of us contending for our sake. We don't understand much of what's going on, even in ordinary days, but needless to say, any spiritual being would be so much more powerful than the strongest human being. It takes courage. It takes courage to face the unknown. And sometimes it takes even more courage when we know. Sometimes when we know, it takes even more courage. When we understand the enemy, it takes even more courage. And Jesus Though we don't understand this man, and his contemporaries didn't understand him, Jesus understands him. And yet, Jesus faces him. The passage reminds us that we, we, we too will face scary situations, we will face scary people, we will face opposition. We contend with the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. When we follow Jesus, when we help others to follow him, we are stepping in to spiritual warfare. We don't just battle people who don't like Jesus, who don't want to hear about him. We fight also the spiritual forces behind them. If we are true disciples of Jesus, we are in a spiritual war because we are actively following him and we are actively working for his kingdom. And though we know his kingdom will win and his kingdom will stand, we know that the battle is not yet finished. Spiritual war is scary, but Jesus gives us courage, showing us his example that he faces it. Are we ready to face it? If you've been in a sport, there are times where you face an enemy and you understand how good they are. There's a story about a, a football player named Willie. Willie was playing the, the biggest, meanest team in the league, and after each play, one of his teammates would be carried across the field and, and then carried by, having suffered an injury because they're just, they're just getting run over. They're just getting destroyed. Willie didn't get a lot of playing time, and, and the, the, the crowd is starting to chant, give Willie the ball, give Willie the ball. And, and Willie stands on the sidelines watching his team get destroyed. And, and as the chant continues, finally, Willie can't stand, uh, can't stand it any longer, runs over to the cheerleaders, grabs a megaphone, and he yells out, shut up, Willie don't want the ball. 
He understands the enemy. He understands how scary it is out on that playing field. But the question is, do you want the ball? Do you want to carry the gospel even when it's scary? We look to Jesus for courage. And Jesus showed courage because he was on a mission of mercy to this man. What drives, what is it that feeds this courage? Where does this strength really come from? And we see that the source of Jesus' strength, what drives Jesus to face the enemy, is the force, the power of compassion. It is compassion that's required. The only thing that can lead Jesus to go up to this wild and crazy man, the only thing that can lead us to go up to people that we don't understand, powerful people, scary people, is the power of compassion. That compassion that as Jesus is standing with his disciples and they look out and they see this vast gathering of people and they say, what, sort of like, what are we going to do with all these people? And Jesus looks out at them, and it says he looks out at them, and he has compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And it is then that he says, we need to pray to the Lord for workers to go into the harvest. It's all driven by compassion. Everyone else had long given up caring about him. He was too dangerous. He'd hurt them too much. Everyone avoided him, but not Jesus. Jesus sees through the exterior. He looks beneath the hardness, the harshness, the wildness to see a a person. To see someone with a hurting heart. Jesus saw the real problem and the only solution. A new heart and a renewed mind. And so it's worth taking a moment to talk about what, what really is when it comes to discipleship. One of the most difficult questions that we deal with, especially in our own day and age, and this may be even vary depending on your culture, depending on your location, this whole idea of demon possession. When you read through the Gospels, you see that problem often. And today, especially in the developed world, especially in the Western world, we don't talk a lot about demon possession. We kind of scoff at it, smirk at it. We're, we're far, far more advanced. We might talk about disorders, psychological syndromes, mental diseases, genetic deficiencies, social pathologies. And we say, well, that's really the problem. And the Bible is primitive in describing it as a demonic influence. So maybe, you know, the contemporary contemporary, uh, psychotherapist would go up to this man and would say, this man needs medication. Was the Bible just misguided and mistaken and primitive, superstitious, simplistic when it talks about demons? But you need to understand, even sort of bridging the two, when we think about any syndrome, when we think about any sickness at all, what are the roots of sickness? Where does sickness come from? Why do people get sick? Even medical doctors might never ask that. They spend their entire lives fixing illnesses, and you never ask, so why did this person get ill? You know, they were born with a good body, and at one point they were healthy, so why are they ill now? All illness, physical, mental, and emotional, all social, comes from the fallen nature of our bodies, the curse upon this world, and the spiritual battle that's taking place. It is all the result of the devil's work in some way. It can ultimately all be tra- traced back to the fall in Eden. Our own sinful rebellion against God is so often the root of the devil's working in some way. Our prideful willness, our, our, our prideful willfulness to have our own way, our own self-righteousness, our own self-reliance. It may be the result of someone else's sin against us. So many people, when they're asked about why they do what they do, they'll point back to, well, you know how I was raised. They were abused, molested, and that has profound effects on people's mental well-being. And so even there, it is the result of Satan's work. It is the result of sin. Even if it's the, someone else's sin. Sin's corrupting influences everywhere. And, and, and this must be pointed out. This must be clear. Because it must, it, it must be clear that even though that problem seems so strange, and demon possession seems so 
out there and so crazy, we must recognize a certain normalcy to it. That we all struggle with the same basic problems, illnesses, and needs, whether we are believers or unbelievers. That all of our illnesses, all that plagues us, is rooted in the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And it is only when we get that that we don't see those people and just push them away. But instead, we have compassion on them. Instead, we, we try to reach out to them. The word compassion means the same passions. It means feeling what others feel. Sympathizing. We can have compassion on others only when we realize our struggle is similar. We share that struggle. We can have compassion on others when we realize that, that, that in a lot of ways we're no different. Then we reach out with the good news of Jesus because Jesus has been good news to us. And we don't want to keep that good news only to ourselves. We want to share him with others just like us. Now these first two qualities Jesus shows us, courage and compassion, are wonderful, but they aren't quite enough. Not without what Jesus did in verse 13 and 15. Back in verse 4 it said, No one was strong enough to subdue this person, this demon-possessed man. But we see the power of Jesus, the power of the gospel, the power of the Holy Spirit. Verses 13 and 15. Jesus shows not merely courage, not merely compassion, but praise God, Jesus shows capability. Capability to change a person. Jesus shows capability to change a person. Society had no answers. So they resort to isolation. And we still do, tend to do that. Put all those people in a building, under lock, far away from society. Just hide them. We resort to isolation, incarceration. And those don't change a person. The man couldn't control or help himself, but in verse 15, we see a very different man. They saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind. What no person could do, Jesus has done. So often discipleship is about us helping people to become this image that shocks everybody. To become uh, an entirely new person in a lot of ways. So that there are others, the other people who knew them. Oh, I knew that guy a long time ago. They see who he is now and they think, how did that happen? I, I, I've, I've had this in my own life. People that I grew up with went through elementary school, high school, and I knew them. And other people would try to, you know, teachers would try to control them. Teachers would try to do this or, or, or do that. And, and there was no controlling that person. And now that I've, I've been out of school for so many years, I, I go back to my hometown and I see some of these people again. And you can just look in their eyes. And it's like, this is the same person, but yet this isn't the same person. And, and what happened was Jesus. What happened was somebody came alongside and discipled them. That's the power of discipleship. This picture that we see of this man who's dressed, who, who is now a part of society, living like a normal human being in his, right man, in his right mind, thinking sensibly and clearly. Jesus had removed the demons whose voices created this cacophony in his mind. The confusion, the mental static. Now he can focus. Now he can reason. And now, according to verses 18 through 20, this man could feel and care again. He begs to go with Jesus. But Jesus now sends him back in compassion on his family. Now he cared about Jesus who had cared about him. And he could remember the people in his past. He could remember his family. What a profound testimony. What a profound witness it would be. And he could care enough to tell them about Jesus, to tell them where to find help and hope, the same help and hope that he found. This kind of change is night and day. And that's the change of Jesus. So often, so often the mistake that we make in Christianity is that we think, we, or we treat Jesus as if Jesus is for good people to get a little better. And Jesus here is showing us by example 
that that's not the case at all. Jesus is for people who are lost, for people who are scary, for people who are out of control, for people who are dead to become alive, for people who are in bondage to become free. Jesus is not about just improvement. Jesus is about resurrection. Jesus is about complete freedom. And Jesus is still capable of changing people today. We see all these amazing, life-changing ministries. Maybe your own life is one of those stories, of one of the results of one of those ministries. Today, you, you have the ministry of prison fellowship. It's started by Chuck Colson. And Chuck Colson himself is a testimony, is himself one of those stories. Finding Christ, being made alive through prison fellowship. Then his ministry, volunteers take the life-changing gospel into prisons to inmates. To these bad people, dangerous people, scary people, the people that society has said, lock them up, keep them away from us. People that a policemen cannot change. People that laws cannot change. The only hope for these people is the good news, the good news of Jesus, to change their hearts so that when they get out, they're different. Now they can become a part of society. Now they're not so scary. They, they get jobs. They keep jobs. They obey laws. They care for their families. They volunteer. They help others. They love God. They love other people. It's totally different. And it's all the work of Jesus who is capable to change a person. Jesus has changed so many lives think of one pastor's story uh, a woman that he met in a terminal ward one pastor is working as a chaplain and he meets this woman who's a chain smoker she's estranged from her family and she comes to the hospital with a persistent cough only to learn that she had months to live and so this chaplain goes into her room on the first day and she goes up in her bed and she says, have you come to take me? Are you an angel? And they talk for a while. And she's really angry. She's afraid of dying. She's scared. But over those next months, this chaplain shares the gospel. The woman becomes a believer. She mellows softens she starts rebuilding family ties surprising her family no doubt she left the hospital after her treatments still terminal but with a lot of life ahead of her suddenly everlasting life ahead of her and a lot of life in her a changed woman and you have your own stories You've seen Jesus change lives as well. Jesus passes that life-changing capability on to his disciples. He told them in Matthew 10, verse 8, to heal the sick and raise the dead and cleanse those who have leprosy and drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. And he tells his disciples in Matthew 28 to go and to make disciples. And he gives us the Holy Spirit. Lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. He gives us the powerful weapon of prayer to call in extra strength, to lean on the Holy Spirit and the ammunition of the gospel. So why don't we see Jesus' capability more today? Why don't we see more amazing changed lives? Before answering that, let's see one more thing that Jesus shows here. Jesus shows, finally, his commitment. His commitment to the Great Commission. He went out of his way to go across the lake through the storm, to bring the gospel specifically to this man. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. The storm was not a mistake. It was not an error. He knows exactly what he's doing. And it didn't matter that the devil had thrown a storm against Jesus to keep him from this man. It didn't matter that they were seeing just one man. Oh, for just this one guy? So often, the temptation for me as a pastor is to count heads. The, mo the, the best ministries are the ones with the big numbers. And Jesus is showing us that so, sometimes, instead of having a buckshot, where we spread the gospel to as many people as possible, instead, the most effective way 
is to pick one person, to just one person, and to pursue them, and to go through a storm to get to them. He challenges this man to continue that chain by sending him home to his family. Tell them to share with them what Jesus had done. Jesus put aside heaven. He put aside earthly security and comfort. He put aside all personal interests to bring the good news of the life-changing gospel. Jesus came to a sin-infested, dangerous world. A world where there was no guarantee that he would get through safely. In fact, the guarantee was that he would be betrayed. The guarantee was that he would be put on, 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 he would be put on the stand and falsely tried, beaten, and mocked. He comes to a dangerous world that would crucify him. But it shows his commitment to the cause, his commitment to the commission. How do we then show the same commitment to follow him? How committed are we to the Great Commission given to every disciple to go into this scary world with the capabilities of the gospel? How are we showing that commitment? Will we risk offending family and friends and neighbors and co-workers to talk about Jesus? Will we leave our comfort zone to join new groups so that we can meet new people who don't know Jesus yet? Will we cross the street to meet that strange neighbor whose language and life is different from ours? Will we cross peer group lines to go to children? To go to the guy or girl who dresses and acts a little weird? What about the coworker who has monumental problems? Will we go to them? The disciples would never have seen Jesus' courage, compassion, capability, and commitment if they hadn't followed him into this scary situation and this scary place. And maybe that's why. Maybe that's why we don't see powerfully changed lives because we're not willing to go into scary places. We're afraid of what we might bump into. We don't go into situations where we need to find courage from Jesus. We don't really trust Jesus, and so we don't even try. We don't share the gospel with scary people, people who are really messed up. We don't see Jesus' compassion because we've forgotten how messed up we were also. We don't see Jesus' compassion. We don't see his capability, his amazing capability because we don't reach out to people too different from us, too difficult for us to talk with. We play it safe. This is a a scene to help us not be afraid. Don't ask Jesus, where are you taking me? No, instead, we follow. And there are times where it will feel like we're going it alone, and yet he's with us the entire way. There's, there's the story of a, of a dad who's fixing his car. The car has big problems, and he's fixing his car, and his, and his son, five, six-year-old son, sitting there watching him fix the car, and then his son asks, well, can I, can I help you fix it? And finally, you know, he, he says, well, yeah, just in, in, in a second, you'll, you'll be able to help me out. And so he puts together all the different things that need to get put together, and then just that one last step, he invites his son to come over and and his son comes up and, 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 and he guides his hands to do that final connection. And it's a big deal for the son. And, and they go back inside and, and, uh, and their mom is, the mom is in, inside doing some of the things. And the dad says, yep, well, our, son helped, our, our son fixed the car. So often life is like that with us. Where, where we really are, we really jump in and we really do it. And yet he is the one, his strong hand is behind us. His strong hand is leading us and guiding us the whole way. So that it really, we do do it, but really, it's him. And, and we're just his instruments. That's the example of discipleship. Points to ponder, three of them. Again, are there any scary people in your life right now? And how and why are they scary? What's scary about them to you? Second, in what ways have you seen Jesus do amazing things in your own life or in your own context? Third, have you seen Jesus bring amazing transformation? Three principles to practice as well. 
Whom or what are you scared about when it comes to discipling others? What is scary to you about it? Second, how should Jesus' promise of his presence and power help you to disciple others? And third, you need to ask yourself and examine your own heart. How committed are you to the Great Commission? To whom ought you to go with the gospel? This ends our eighth session. Next, in the ninth session, we look at the educating of the disciples. Until next time, talk to you later.